Hi everyone, thank you for, for coming to uh, uh, Swift Language User Group San Francisco. We're probably San Francisco's uh, largest uh, Swift and iOS related meetup group. Uh, our events are online until we can, we can find someone to host us at their office. Uh, we are always looking for speakers. So if you do want to talk at our meetup, do let us know. And if you do want to host us in person, uh, if you, the company you work with can host us, with, do get in touch. Um, uh, the, 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 to, to, to today, uh, we have an awesome speaker lined up for you, uh, Tim Condon, uh, core developer for the Vapor framework, is here to do a talk on server-side Swift, State of the Union. Over to you, Tim. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's nice to be able to travel virtually um, as much as I miss being over in the States, at least I get to avoid the jet lag and hours in the airport. Um, so today I'm going to um, give you a kind of state of the union on server-side Swift and kind of where we are, how we got to the point and what's coming up in the future that will make Swift really exciting uh, for the server. So uh, introduction we get going. Uh, I'm Tim. I run a company called Broken Hands and we provide uh, training, uh, consultancy and contract work uh, for clients all over the world. So I've got clients in California and all the way through the time zones to New Zealand as well. Um, so we do run training courses and uh, help clients deploy server-side Swift. So it's exclusively server-side Swift work that I do. Uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, on the core team of Vapor. Um, so responsible for the maintenance of the framework, um, the future of the framework, funding, uh, distributing work and stuff, um, which is always great and really exciting. Um, I sit on the SSWG, which is the Swift Server Workgroup, and the newly announced SWWG, which is the Swift Website Workgroup. Um, so the Swift Server Workgroup is responsible for advocating the advances, uh, advocating the use of Swift on the server and any of the Swift on server requirements. But I'll be talking more about that in the presentation today. And the Website Workgroup is for basically improving Swift.org. We are all aware that it is uh, a very 90s site. It's probably the nicest way of putting it. Um, so over the coming months, we should see some uh, in changes uh, on Swift.org to really kind of bring it into a, the modern day and improve the kind of collection of uh, information that we have on there and make it more accessible. Um, I am the server side Swift team lead for raywindlick.com. So we have articles and books and tutorials and video courses on server side Swift. Uh, and if you have any questions, um, you can follow me or find me on Twitter, uh, GitHub and Slack, Discord and all those things. Uh, so I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if anything pops up. Uh, and then finally, I organize a couple of meetups here in the UK um, and also the server-side.swift conference. Um, and keep an eye out because hopefully in the next week or so, we should have some exciting news about server-side.swift 2022. So, uh, Swift on the server. So, kind of, how do we get here, really? Um, so, Swift was open sourced in 2016, uh, and this was kind of the main requirement for it to be able to run on the server because when it was open sourced, uh, it was available for Linux. And as soon as it was available for Linux, it means that people could start using it uh, for server applications. Not many people are really going to run Swift on the server on macOS uh, because of the deployment um, issues. It's too expensive and, and too hard to easily deploy macOS systems. Uh, so Linux is where it is. So in 2016, it was released. And I think back then it supported Ubuntu 14, Ubuntu 18, uh, Ubuntu 16 rather. Um, and Swift Package Manager came out. Uh, and that, at that point, we could start um, building server applications. Uh, so several frameworks were created. There was Vapor and Perfect and Zero, um, and Swift on the server was born. Uh, and that was kind of the start of the journey. So it's only been six years, um, which is quite a short time compared to some of the more established and uh, frameworks out there in other languages. So back then, we've kind of gone through a large number of changes. Uh, Swift 4 came out. Um, so Swift 3 was when Swift was open source, but Swift 4 came out after that, obviously. Uh, and we had COBOL, uh, which made a huge difference to anyone kind of doing any JSON work. Um, trying to imagine what it was like writing uh, JSON stuff uh, decoding and encoding before Codable um, is quite difficult these days because we kind of got so used to it. So that was a really nice feature. There are a large number of improvements to String API, obviously very important for working on the server where most of your inputs and outputs are strings. Uh, we had the introduction of key paths, uh, which enabled frameworks like Vapor to do um, type-safe uh, querying in the database. 
Um, and then Swift 5 came out, and we're kind of still in the Swift 5 as it slows down and matures. But we had a large number of changes in Swift 5. We've had UTF-8 strings. So before Swift 5, all strings were UTF-16, because that's what they are in Chip to C. Uh, in Swift 5, the core team made the decision to switch strings to be UTF-8 under the hood. And this is a huge performance boost for the server, because everything on the server is UTF-8. So instead of having to copy between the two every time you wanted to jump into Swift, uh, it's now native UTF-8, and that provided huge performance boosts. Uh, we had things like property wrappers, um, which are used uh, in Vapor for uh, database queries. So your models defined using property wrappers, and they use elsewhere as well. Um, lots of people are starting to use them and find fun implementations for them. And we had Xcode 11 uh, brought along support for Swift Package Manager. Um, so before this, you had to kind of generate an Xcode project, and it was a bit of a hack. And it really kind of held up Swift Package Manager adoption. Um, since then, um, Xcode 11 has proper inbuilt support. Um, and you can also write Swift on other IDs now as well. So back in 2020, I wrote a blog post kind of talking about Swift on the server. Um, it was an interesting time because IBM had kind of just left um, the Swift on the server space. And there were a lot of people kind of worried about what the future held for Swift on the server, uh, having a big company drop out. Um, and it was kind of justifiably um, worrying, but I think in that time, we've kind of proven that Swift on the server has um, grown way bigger than one big one company. And we've seen a whole range of stuff um, since then. So if you go to the Swift.org blog, um, in the time since I wrote that post, you can see that we've had a whole swathe of uh, releases for Swift that have basically been just server releases with a little bit of iOS on the side. So at the very start of 2020, we had Swift Crypto. And this is obviously hugely important having a central cryptography library, I should probably make it clear, um, because before that, people were having to kind of roll their own crypto libraries. So people bundling open SSL or bending their own boring SSL implementations. And now we have a central crypto library that most people can build on top of, and then you only have one central package. Then uh, a couple of months later, uh, we announced, or the Swift team announced more support for additional Linux distributions. So um, newer versions of Ubuntu were supported, CentOS was supported, Amazon Linux was supported. Um, and this allowed people who were running Swift, uh, who were running server applications in their companies to be able to run Swift on their kind of approved distribution. And then this led to a couple of months later when the Swift AWS Lambda runtime was introduced. So <clears throat> this is kind of an official supported um, runtime for AWS Lambda, which allows you to run serverless applications and functions uh, written in Swift. Um, and it's a really great language for this kind of thing because, because it's compiled um, the cold start times are really uh, impressive compared to say Python or JavaScript. So if you have a Lambda that hasn't been touched in a while and the AWS um, environment is kind of put it to sleep because it's been um, not in use. Uh, your cold start times, which is basically the time it takes for it to start back up when it's first used again, can be a big um, performance hit, uh, can be a bit of a problem if you have high performance applications. So some languages like Python and Ruby can take up to a second for their cold start times to go. Um, Swift is kind of a couple of hundred milliseconds, and which is kind of well in the realms of acceptable response times. So it's a really good language to see, and it's really great to see more use cases of Swift on the server. <clears throat> then we had Swift Service Lifecycle, which is all about managing the lifecycle of applications so that people could write their own lifecycle hooks. Um, so if your application is killed for different reasons, um, all the parts of all the um, parts of that application can listen in to that lifecycle hook and all use it. So it's again, it's another common API for standard implementation stuff that people need on the server. Uh, then later on that year, we had Swift Cluster Membership, which is a really interesting uh, project um, that hasn't really seen too much uh, limelight, I'd say, but it makes some really interesting use cases for writing very distributed systems. Uh, then later on, another kind of keep on going, we had Swift System, which is about replacing some of the low-level uh, C um, APIs for interacting with system libraries. Um, and making it standard for Swift. So if you're kind of writing to the file system um, or uh, interacting with the kernel or kind of any of these low level stuff, the low level system inter interfaces that you need to talk to, this provided a common standard Swift API and library for you to use. So you didn't have to write a separate one for Linux and a separate one for Mac OS and a separate one for Windows. 
Uh, and then we had Swift Service Discovery. So we keep on going with more blog posts. And these are all server um, blog posts. Uh, so Swift.org has been very focused on server um, over the last couple of years. So service discovery is when you have multiple microservices all running and you need a way of discovering which of your instances for a particular microservice are alive and where they live and how to talk to them. Uh, so it's really great to see a swift implementation of this service discovery output. Um, <clears throat> and then we had Swift near SSH, so an SSH library uh, for being able to connect to um, remote servers, um, all these important things that are predominantly used on the server. So I could keep going about the Swift all blog, but I highly recommend you go and check it out because there are a lot of really interesting projects that have been announced in that. So one of the questions I probably more often these days used to get asked rather than do get asked now is, is Swift on the server ready for production? Uh, well, yes, yes it is. Um, we've uh, kind of been through this and I think we're now at the point where we can prove that it is being used and it's being used um, by very big companies with very high user traffic. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the Server Side Swift um, conference webpage, we have videos from the kind of past previous conferences conferences and there are some really interesting use cases from uh, different companies using Swift on the server talking about how it's benefited them and how it's made their lives better for writing the language that has a compiler to a really memory efficient language um, so I really recommend you go and check some of those out. So there are quite a few companies who use Swift on the server. Um, Mercedes-Benz use it for um, a lot of their in-car infotainment systems. The back ends for that are written in Swift. And the uh, in-dealership um, kind of consoles, uh, their APIs are written using Swift as well. Um, ING Bank, which is quite a big bank over here in the uh, in Europe, um, and they have a subsidiary called Fin. Uh, they've written some banking apps and banking APIs that are done in Swift. So they're processing real money using Swift because they believe it works. Allegro, which is kind of a very large e-commerce um, site, uh, they're kind of Poland's Amazon, essentially. Um, they did a really interesting talk a couple of years ago at the conference about how they switched some of their image processing microservices from Java to Swift and saw massive performance boosts and huge savings in memory usage, uh, which saved them a lot of money. Amazon uh, use Swift on the server. So if you've ever watched anything on Amazon Prime, that's gone through a Swift on the server um, application and several Swift on the server applications. Uh, the Prime Video team chose Swift um, because of the, the benefits of the language. So they used to be Java developers. They, they weren't iOS developers, but they picked Swift because of the benefits of the language um, over some of the more traditional languages. Spotify have some, done some really interesting stuff um, with Swift on the server. Um, with some of their uh, build integration stuff for their iOS teams. So they've released a couple of open source tools about how they use Vapor for tracking build metrics um, and some really interesting stuff they've done. So they have some blog posts on that which you should check out. The BBC here in the UK uh, use Swift on the server to power a lot of their test harnesses for their um, mobile applications. Um, I know because I used to work there and I forced them to use it, um, but they're still going apparently. I caught up with them, um, a couple of my old colleagues this week, um, and they still have uh, paper applications powering the uh, video test harnesses, which is pretty cool. And of course, Apple. Um, so I think Apple have now uh, said on Twitter or a forum or <clears throat> a podcast somewhere that iCloud is using Swift on the server. Um, and you can be guaranteed that they would not be putting this much time and engineering effort and money into Swift on the server if they weren't using it themselves. Um, I think they have a very vested interest in making sure it works, um, which is why we're seeing so many libraries and um, development opportunities and job openings for Swift on the server at Apple. Um, and they were probably the biggest user of Swift on the server out there. Um, so if you take all of those companies and all the users, there's a lots and lots of big applications and big companies using Swift on the server because it works. So there's a couple of new languages that have kind of come out in the last few years. One of them is Rust and, and another one Go. And they're this kind of cohort of new languages um, being used for everything from low level development to kind of um, microservice development. And <clears throat> People have kind of realized these days that they, they need a language that provides assurances for memory safety, um, provides a really good concurrency runtime, uh, provides 
um, a type safety uh, thing to fall back onto, provides um, a lot of insurances for writing applications that you can trust will work. So with Rust and with Go, um, if you're writing concurrent code, you can be pretty happy that it works. Rust has got a really fantastic memory management model um, where you'll get compiler errors if you try and do stuff that will break um, the memory management or the memory kind of access pattern. So if you try and access stuff from other threads, you'll get compiler errors. Go has got a really fantastic concurrency runtime uh, using Go routines. Um, and it's been written from the ground up um, to be to be used for uh, asynchronous applications on the server. They're both kind of very similar. Um, they have low memory footprints and they're strongly typed, um, but they kind of have advantages and disadvantages. So Rust is a very good language for low level stuff, but it has a very steep learning curve. Um, you end up having to kind of worry about memory management, even though the compiler takes care of it for you, you kind of have to know how it works under the hood. Go, on the other hand, is kind of the opposite end of the scale. It's very, very simple. It has, it's really easy to learn, um, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, more of a kind of complex language features that you would expect when writing very large applications. So for instance, generics have only just been introduced in Go. Before that, you'd have to copy and paste code everywhere. And quite a few people have kind of mentioned that um, there needs to be some language in between um, the two, from the very complex the Rust to the really simple Go. Uh, that has very similar features, has optionals. Um, and of course, the language, in my opinion, at least, that fulfills that is, is Swift. Swift is easy to learn. I mean, it's used for kind of um, in schools and education to teach basics of programming, but it has these extra kind of more complex features that if you need, you can tap into. Um, it has a really great concurrency model now as well, now that async await's been released. Um, and some of the stuff we're seeing coming up, which I'll talk about later, um, are making kind of assurances around memory access. So it's really interesting to see how this how Swift is going to evolve to kind of um, push apart these two languages to take over its space. And I think it will, I really do. <clears throat> um, so here's another example of um, usage of Swift on the server. This was taken um, a few months ago now, I must admit, um, but Vapor has, I think we're up to about 14,000 server members now. Um, not all of these are obviously active, but we have a large number of active developers. So if you have questions, you can go and answer them. Um, and I think our usage stats on GitHub have doubled um, since this was taken. So we get about um, a thousand uh, unique clones a day um, and kind of several thousand clones for build systems um, every day. Um, so we get a lot of usage of, of Vapor. Okay, so let's talk about the Swift Server Workgroup. So Swift Server Workgroup was founded um, several years ago now, um, back in 20, I want to say 18. And it's made up these days of members from Apple, from Vapor, from MongoDB, and from Amazon. And its kind of remit is to advocate um, for the desires of Swift on the server. So we have uh, good relationships with the Swift core team, uh, with the language team, with the CI team, with the build infrastructure team, um, and obviously teams like Swift Neo, um, who are part of the, the work group. So if we need things changed in either the package manager or the language runtime or any of those things, we can kind of push for those things to be done. Uh, and this means that we can make sure that Swift is viable for the server and, and works on the server. Um, and we've had quite a, a lot of input into the recent changes to the concurrency model. Um, the, a lot of the members of the SSWG were very instrumental in writing those uh, things. Um, Comrade, who's um, one of the Apple um, members, <clears throat> has done things on uh, distributed actors, which is a really exciting proposal. Um, and we are really we meet every two weeks, and we really are kind of making sure that Swift on the server is a viable product. Um, and we're kind of getting a lot of work done in Swift um, to make sure that it it stays that way. And yeah, the goal is to basically steer the direction of the ecosystem as well, so we can make sure that we steer community efforts. Um, and we can make sure that community effort isn't duplicated uh, to make sure that using Swift on the server is an, is an easy option. So we have an incubation process, and um, this follows the Cloud Native Computing Foundation incubation process. Um, so if you have a package that you think is uh, worthwhile for Swift on the server, you can submit it uh, as a pitch to be incubated. Um, and then the idea is that any of the incubated packages that have reached the graduating status 
are battle tested, well maintained, well tested, uh, well used, um, and you can be assured if you pick them up that they will work and they'll work solidly. So we have quite a few projects now that have been graduated, uh, including Swift Neo, and there's several other, well, tens of other packages in there that are going through that process at the moment. So we have everything from database drivers for MySQL and Postgres and MongoDB, um, through to crypto libraries, through to metrics libraries like Swift Prometheus and StatsD. Um, we have an APNS library. Uh, there's libraries for AWS and AWS SDK. Um, so pretty much most things that you need to, read to write server applications are part of the incubation process as well. So the, the main reason we do this is because we want to provide a consistent approach for people writing Swift on server applications. So um, if you're writing uh, anything to do with Swift logging or metrics or tracing or crypto, we want to make sure that you have a library that can provide a nice API for you to use. So a really good example of this is metrics. So if we didn't provide a metrics API for people to use, then every package that they pulled in might have their own, own metrics implementations. And then trying to link all those up would be really complicated. Um, however, we provide a library called Swift Metrics, uh, and this provides an API for metrics uh, to be emitted by applications. So it means that Vapor, for instance, can emit app, uh, metrics via Swift Metrics, and then anything that depends on Vapor can also emit the same metrics to the same endpoints. Um, and this provides kind of a one-use shop without having to duplicate all of the work. And then we put a blog post out every year um, on Swift.org and uh, kind of looking back on the past year and our goals for this year. And the goals for 2022 are continuing the focus on async await. Um, so we're kind of getting there and we need to make sure that the ecosystem continues to drive forward and adopt async await because we really think it will be transformational for Swift on the server. We're also looking at build times and seeing where we can improve those because we know that's starting to become a bit of an issue. Um, so that might be working with the compiler team to make sure that um, anything in there can be optimized uh, or working with uh, package libraries or package authors to ensure that we're not duplicating compiler things. So a really good example of this is Swift Crypto. So Swift Crypto is basically a Linux port of uh, CryptoKit, um, but it doesn't provide some of the stuff that you might need on the server. For instance, RSA isn't the thing. Um, so we've been working to make sure that the Swift Crypto library provides RSA interfaces so that people don't have to build four copies of boring SSL if they want to use uh, JWT, which requires RSA, and uh, SSL, which requires RSA. And then the final thing we're focusing on for 2022 uh, is improving adoption. So we're aware that as a kind of language um, and as an uh, ecosystem and as an industry, um, that we do a pretty poor job of selling Swift on the server. Uh, and this goes for Vapor as well. Vapor is equally guilty, if not more of this. Um, we know that there are lots of people out there using it. Uh, we know that people have the knowledge out there, but we're not doing a very good job of selling that. So we're going to we're focusing on ways to improve the adoption to kind of prove to people that it is working. Um, so you'll see some of this work come out in the Swift.org rewrite when um, we add new content to that. So we'll have better documentation for the server. We'll have better installation instructions. Um, we are, we've just released or kind of released a few months ago, a VS code extension for Swift um, that's being driven by the community and maintained by the Swift server work group. And this basically gives you first class support for writing Swift in VS code, uh, either on Linux or on uh, Mac and on Windows as well. And it provides all the features from Xcode that you expect. So you can do LLDB debugging, you get autocomplete, you get syntax highlighting, uh, you get test support. Um, so if you're interested in using that, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, and then the other tool that we're building this year is uh, what's um, at the moment called Swiftly, although the name might change, and it's basically a Swift version of Rust up. So this is it will be a script to allow you to install, easily install Swift and manage different versions of Swift. So instead of having to go to Swift.org, downloading a tarball, making sure that all your dependencies are installed, you can run this one command and it will install everything you need and install Swift and the version that you want and keep it up to date. So we're really excited to see kind of how that helps improve uh, adoption of Swift on the server. Um, and we'll be working with the SWWG to ensure that the guides on there are really good. There's a nice big, if I get my way, there's a nice big server box in the middle on Swift at all when you go to the home page to make sure that people know that it works on the server. So there are a few other frameworks out there uh, for writing web-side Swift applications. 
Uh, one of the newer ones is one called Meridium. Um, it's got some really cool routing stuff um, using declarative routers, um, which is really exciting to see. There's Hummingbird, uh, which is kind of like a um, very lightweight um, framework. Um, so it has a similar API to Vapor, but Vapor tends to include a lot of things that you need and probably some stuff that you don't need. Whereas Hummingbird is much more lightweight and includes very limited stuff. And then if you need extra things, you can add them on, uh, on the side. Uh, there's a language called Smoke, and we don't need that. Um, so, so there's a video from the um, Service Side Swift conference. Uh, so Smoke is Amazon's um, Service Side Swift framework, and it's open source as well. Uh, and Simon Pilkington uh, from Amazon did, did a really interesting talk on why they're using it and how they're using it, um, and what's kind of their, their goals with Smoke. So it's obviously built for their use case, but you can use it as well. <clears throat> so you might be wondering, why would I be talking about uh, other languages as a Vapor core team member? Um, well, I think competition is great. You know? um, there's plenty of space for multiple uh, frameworks on server-side Swift. They all have their different use cases, and anything that increases adoption and drives us forward is going to be good. Um, and we can borrow ideas from each of the other frameworks as well. I'm really interested in looking to see how declarative routing comes out. Um, and whether that's something we can borrow in Vapor going forward. So <clears throat> looking kind of at the present day present day Swift, um, we had async await land in Swift 5.5. And async await is great for iOS, but for the server, it's really, really transformative. transformative. And we think this is probably one of the, the kind of missing pieces of Swift. So async await is first class concurrency in Swift, if I'm sure everyone knows that by now, but it's a, a concurrency model built into the language itself rather than having to be bolted on as a package. It was released in 5.5 back in September, October, depending on which platform you're on. And it really is the missing piece for the server. Um, in the server world, um, certainly anything built on top of Swift Neo, um, everything is asynchronous. So whether you're making requests to a database, whether you're making requests to a third-party API, whether you're streaming a file from disk, they're all asynchronous. And the way of doing this in the past was to uh, was using features and promises. And so you'd end up with really horribly nested code. Um, so uh, this is a really good example taken from a client project of mine of quite a simple um, bit of logic um, but you have multiple return um, places because depending on where the features end, uh, you have errors which are thrown as futures, failed futures. And you can see that we kind of nest more and more and more as we kind of go down the asynchronous chain. Rewriting this into async await is really simple. You can see it's kind of halved the number of lines of code uh, and flattened everything. So it's all very easy to kind of scan through the code and see what it's doing. Um, and we only return in one or two places rather than five or six places. So we're really excited to see kind of how this is gonna um, be used by people and how much simpler it's gonna make writing Swift on the server applications, because it was a real big barrier to, a, to for people coming to Swift on the server and um, having to learn how features and processes work. Um, and so now we've kind of gotten rid of that, we're hoping it's gonna be a lot easier for people to get started. So for async await in Vapor, um, we managed to add it with no breaking changes, which is fantastic. Um, so it's backwards compatible. Uh, it landed in 4.50, which was released back in October. Um, and effectively, we duplicated a lot of our APIs. So everything that returned the future or everything that returns a future um, that was used and is popular and is public now has an async await um, API as well. And it means you can use it when you can use it today. So you don't have to wait for us to release a new version of the framework. Um, and most people have started to port over and we're kind of encouraging people to start using async await now. And um, there are a few considerations with it. Um, it might, um, you might see a slight performance hit depending on kind of the type of work you're doing. Um, but we think for most people, the maintenance um, improvements and readability improvements and um, being able to have multiple people working on it without having to learn Swift on the server in depth uh, is way worth um, any kind of small performance hit, if there is any at all. So looking forward in Vapor, um, <clears throat> at some point in the future, we will be releasing Vapor 5. And it's going to be a, basically a complete rewrite under the hood, at least, um, for using async await. So all of Vapor's internals, or most of Vapor's internals now, are still future-based. Um, we still use, we have a bridge at kind of where the public API is, um, but we want to kind of get rid of that and go async await all the way down the step. Um, 
we are aiming to release it alongside um, what probably will be Swift 6 and Swift Neo 3. Um, we're assuming that they'll come out at some point in the future and that they will be um, released at the same time. Um, if they aren't, aren't, then we'll make changes. But at the moment, Vapor is planning to release Vapor 5 when Swift 6 is released, whenever that is. Um, I suspect it'll be about a year away at least. Um, so you still have a, a while back, a while to wait and a while to um, use async await in Vapor 4. And yeah, we want to kind of really go deep with integrating with language features. Um, so we're going to be using async await everywhere. We're going to be using sendable everywhere. Um, we'll be pulling in some of the newer packages like Swift system that we haven't been able to adopt today before um, to really kind of provide a modern stable framework. And we really think the Vapor 5 is going to be um, one to last around for quite a while. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look into kind of some of the future changes that we have coming in Swift um, that will predominantly be used for the server. So task local values is a really interesting proposal that's now being implemented in Swift 5.5. And this is basically a way of attaching um, essentially a storage container to tasks. So um, you can add values to tasks um, and then your child tasks can then add values um, to that task and the parent, ta parent task can read the child's task local values. And for kind of client um, applications or iOS applications, most people probably aren't really going to use this too much. It is predominantly a language feature for Swift on the server. And it's predominantly used for distributed tracing. So distributed tracing is a way of um, tracking requests across a microservice architecture. So if you have, say, a backend that has a thousand microservices, um, you will have cases where you will have a request that comes in and that needs to talk to 20, 30, 40, 100 other microservices. At some point in that chain, it's going to fail. And debugging that with logs is, is complicated and very, very hard. So distributed tracing is a way of basically attaching your request ID to each of those requests so that as it goes into each microservice, it has the same request ID um, and then you can look that up. <clears throat> so I did a talk on this actually um, last year. Um, talking about how we've implemented distributed tracing in Vapor um, before task local values. Um, and I have some examples of kind of some uh, screenshots here. Uh, and you can see that this is a request to our item service to get an item from the um, API. Uh, and it makes a request to the API. Uh, you can see the kind of total time it took. So it took 40 milliseconds to respond to that request. You can see it jumped into four different services. Um, you can see we had a lookup in our store service and our order service, and then finally our item service. And you can see which requests were made um, and how long each took. So this is really good at tracking down which of your services are performing badly. Um, but it's also really great when you have errors. So in this example, you can see here that I have a request that came in, and this returned a 404. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it made a get request to our API layer. It then went into our stores layer, and that was OK, and that found the store. But then we looked up an item that didn't exist, and um, that returned the 404. And so you can immediately look into this and see where your requests are failing. So if you have internal ser server errors, you can find out which, for that request, which of your services failed. And then you can also aggregate all the logs for those requests and see exactly why that failed. And it makes debugging distributed services much, much easier. <clears throat> so this is kind of how we do it in, or how we did it in Vapor um, with Futures. Um, and the way to do it is essentially you have a context and you pass that context every single place that you need to make your third party requests. So whether you're going to another service, another API, your database, you have to pass that request everywhere. Um, and this is the kind of thing that distributed, that task local values is designed to solve. So with task local values, you'll basically assign your values to your task um, or the task container, and then you don't need to pass them everywhere. Um, languages like Go and JavaScript and um, Java um, have different mechanisms for solving this, but most of them involve passing your context everywhere. And if you forget to pass your context everywhere, or you mess it up, or you create a new context, or in Java's case, you forget to save the old context before you overwrite it, um, it can go wrong. And task local values is a really neat language way of solving this problem. So you just don't have to pass the context everywhere. Everywhere, everything is done for you automatically. 
And the final thing that I wanted to point out is Sendable. So Sendable has kind of landed in 5.6, but it hasn't really been turned on. Um, more warnings will be turned on 5.7, but, but Swift 6 is where all the big breaking changes are going to come. So Sendable is effectively a way of marking your structures and your data types as um, making them safe for mutating and data accesses across different threats. Um, so it's designed to stop you from accessing um, data from different threads without using locks or without basically making sure it's safe. And the idea is that when this is fully implemented and fully shipped, um, you'll get compiler warnings and compiler errors if you try and make a request from the wrong thread without ensuring that you are uh, your the thing that you're trying to access is threat safe. Um, and this will make sure that loads of memory access errors are just going to disappear um, because the, it won't let you compile your code um, if you have um, inaccuracies in your data access. Um, so there's, this is based off the ownership manifesto for memory. Um, I highly recommend going to read it. Um, but yeah, this will be really uh, interesting to see how this affects um, Swift on the server specifically. And this also brings it up to speed with things like Rust as well. So uh, that's everything I had to cover today. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to take questions. I have one for you, Tim. Um, yeah. Uh, I agree the fact that we need to ev evangelize uh, the use of Swift, in the, uh, Swift on the server side more. Um, do you, are you aware of any initiatives to uh, make hiring for server side Swift easy, easier. The, re the, re the reason I ask that is that uh, having worked for many companies over the years, uh, part of the, 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 a lot of the decisions of what they use is based on how easy it is for, for them to hire. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I can talk about what we're doing in Vapor, certainly. Um, so we have a few initiatives in Vapor. Um, one of them is a new job section on the website. Um, so we know that there are plenty of Vapor developers out there and there are plenty of companies looking for Vapor developers. Um, I work with a lot of them and I end up training a lot of um, developers from other languages to use Swift and Swift on the server. And so we're going to provide a kind of central place where um, you can uh, add your job listings or you can see where all the job listings are um, and that should provide a really nice way of linking up. Um, the other thing that we are um, going to do is a Vapor affiliates program. So we're going to be working with um, different companies um, who will effectively be approved Vapor experts or consultants. Um, and this, the idea of this is to provide some assurances to bigger corporations out there that if they need help, um, if they need uh, SLAs on response times, if they need training or consultancy work, um, that there are companies who out there who are effectively vetted by Vapor. Um, and so we are in early discussions with setting up. Um, Vapor at the moment is going through a big uh, redesign. So our website's um, currently being completely uh, redone from scratch. Um, we're going to have a big showcase section on there. Uh, I put out a thing last week on Twitter asking people to email me. And um, there's something on the Vapor blog about that. And we see, I've seen, I've probably had 30 or 40 emails already um, in that time with companies and big companies who use Vapor um, to kind of prove to um, anyone out there looking that there are big companies using Vapor and it's um, accessible and possible to use it. Great. I see a question on uh, Twitch. Uh, what new problem spaces can modern Swift solve? I wonder if Swift makes bioinformatics more accessible, for instance. Is it possible we can now process huge amounts of data in flight from a sequencer to a server? Yeah, so I mean, um, the advantages of Swift are um, predominantly compared to other kind of more traditional languages are uh, its performance characteristics. Um, so Swift is a compiled language, it's strong types and static types. Um, so that gives you two big advantages over say, uh, in interpreted languages. Um, so number one is that um, you'll find errors a lot quicker in your code because most of the errors that I encounter are caught by a compiler rather than runtime. Um, so that provides you some assurances where if you're doing something with JavaScript or Python or Ruby, um, you have to run your programs and generally you're not going to find them unless you have really, really good uh, test coverage. Um, the other thing is because Swift is compiled down to a binary, um, it has, it's really performant and it can be 
that you can tune it to be as performant as, as you want, essentially. Um, so um, if you're needing to kind of stream large, large files, um, you can do that asynchronously and only stream uh, the bits that you want into memory. Um, and this means that you can kind of uh, write system proxies that are really efficient in Swift. And so we've seen some examples of uh, proxy servers uh, written in Swift that are very, very efficient because they don't need to load entire requests into memory. Um, we've seen uh, some of the Swift for TensorFlow stuff that's been spun back up. Um, that makes writing uh, large data processing models really efficient because you're using Swift and not Python. Um, and you can compile down your codes into a much more efficient binary than, say, running it in with an interpreter. Great. Uh, we have one more question uh, on Twitch. Uh, is Vapor working on improving the test framework for server side? Uh, yes. So, I mean, I am a big believer in TDD. Um, it's something that I've used for many, many years and will can continue to push for. Um, so Vapor has uh, quite a few test helpers already for um, writing tests for Vapor applications. Um, the, the really nice thing about writing server applications is that they're very, very easy to test generally. Um, so uh, with iOS applications, you kind of have UI stuff that gets in the way. And this makes writing tests quite complicated. And with the server, it's a lot easier because generally you send it requests and you get a response back. Uh, and so you can write your tests and your assertions that you send it this request, you expect this response back, and you expect these changes in the database, for instance. Um, so you can already write lots and lots of tests and very good test coverage using those kind of behavior-driven tests. Um, but Vapor will be adding some stuff to make um, switching out different services a lot easier. So at the moment, um, the service architecture for um, adding services is a bit complicated. Uh, once it's there, it's pretty easy to switch out. So for instance, if you have a uh, uh, request where you make a request to a third-party API, it's very easy to switch out the client that makes that request to kind of a stub client where you can capture it and make sure it makes a request to this URL, it has this body and stuff. Um, if you're doing stuff where you want to do things like a repository pattern where you abstract where your database, setting up that infrastructure that's kind of scaffolding to switch out your uh, database with say an in-memory or a, um, a stub repository is a bit painful. Um, and so yeah, in Vapor 5, we'll definitely be looking to improve that. So it's very easy to write services. So it could be that you're writing services with sign with Apple, or it could be that you're writing services with third party APIs or microservices. So we want to make it really easy to switch those out for different implementations uh, if you need for tests. Great. Uh, one more question. What are the best practices for writing a shared server client framework? <clears throat> uh, so the best practices are work out what you can actually share. Um, so I've done this with several applications, several client projects. Uh, several applications um, and it does get complicated um, what, but one of the really nice things is that um, the kind of the, the first place to start is your uh, data models so the stuff that gets sent over the wire um, in your request and response and you can have a shared swift package um, that's consumed by both vapor and by your ios application or your mac os application or whatever um, and that's definitely where i'd start so basically put out all of the stuff that goes across the wire um, and then it means you don't really have to worry about does the JSON match? Are you using the right coding keys? Because it's just JSON encoder on either end or JSON decoder on either end. Um, so that would be where I start. And that's probably the best place to start. Sharing business logic is a bit more complicated. It can be done. Um, I mean, you can do it because it's just Swift. You can pull out Swift functions and classes and stuff. Whether it's worth it is another matter. Um, and I haven't really seen many use cases where sharing business logic between the server and the client outside of say validating request bodies and stuff like that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I'm sure there are use cases out there um, where it does make sense. Great. Um, are there any swagger tools for Swift server similar to Python fast API? Mm -hmm. Yep, so one of the um, projects in the incubation, um, SSWG incubation process is an open API. Um, library uh, for generating uh, open API specs from roots. Um, Vapor has a wrapper where you can write your roots using this uh, wrapper and it will generate your uh, Swagger um, representations or your open API representations. Um, and one of the, my goals for Vapor 5 is to provide a first class support for open API. 
Um, so you don't have to do this with rapid dance. Um, you can just annotate it with a property wrapper potentially, or um, we'll put it out with a reflection or something. Um, and yeah, so it's possible to do today and we will make it better in the future. Great. Uh, what's your opinion of serverless Swift? Uh, <laughs> serverless stuff, yes. Um, I think serverless stuff is really great for particular use cases. So it's very good for uh, events-based stuff. So responding to, uh, say, webhooks or um, stream data or kind of notifications or events from an event bus. Um, I think that makes a really good use case. Um, the Vapor release bot is um, written using AWS Lambda as a service function. Um, so when we tag really well, when we merge pull requests, if they have a particular label, that sends a webhook that's then parsed by this uh, function, and we generate a release and push out release notes and tag a release on GitHub and uh, send it out to the Discord channel and stuff. So for those use cases, I think it's really great. Um, writing full applications where um, you write kind of REST APIs and that kind of stuff, I. Um, I think you end up duplicating a lot of logic and a lot of code and the uh, deployment and testing uh, environments are still not quite there for doing full server applications for very large applications. Some people make it work and some people really love it. It's really great that you don't have to manage servers, but uh, I find using a framework for some stuff is much better, obviously, but I do have to say that because I maintain a framework. Great. Uh, I, we don't have any more questions on uh, Twitch. Okay. Tim, I can't, I can't thank you enough for doing a talk at our meetup. Please do come back, open invitation whenever you can. And um, hopefully uh, there, there, there will be future conferences in person in Bay Area. So you have an excuse to come so we can meet in person. I would love that. Um, yeah, I'd lo love to come back at some point, preferably in person yeah. as well. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, it'd be fantastic to meet you in person one day. Uh, we do have a question that just came in on Twitch. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you hope for the future of Server Swift? Uh, so I think in terms of the language, I think we kind of have well-defined steps. So sendable and adopt adoption of sendable um, improvements in the concurrency model and making sure task local values work to, to all the things that we need for tracing. Um, I think those are well-defined and will be achieved pretty quickly. Um, one thing that I really want to see is uh, better adoption of tools outside the ecosystem. So if you look at things like GitHub's Dependabot um, or uh, static analysis tools for languages, I'd really love to see Swift get adopted by those. Um, and we have spoken about it with the SSWG to see if we can direct some effort there or prod some people, um, because then that provides another kind of assurance that Swift is a real server language because your dependencies are automatically checked. And if the CVE is raised against, say, Vapor or Swift Neo, um, you'll automatically get a notification to say update. Um, so those kind of things I'd really like to see. Um, and then kind of better better documentation and getting started resources for learners. So whether that's Swiftly to enable inst installation of Swift to make it like really, really easy uh, and, what, and better docs. And um, that's something we're working on Vapor as well with our big redesign. We're kind of aligning all the docs and making sure they're um, easy and accessible, uh, have multiple language translations as well. So we have Chinese, German, and uh, Dutch, and South Korean coming through. Um, so more translations for those will be, make it more accessible for people as well. So that's what I'd love to see going forward. Great, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, currently, there's no other questions, but um, yeah, yeah. Whilst we would just uh, wrap up, just wanted mm -hmm. to say that any, anyone uh, attending on my Twitch uh, want to do a talk at this meetup, please do get in touch with me. And also, um, I believe iOS happy hour is just kicking off in case anyone wants to go to an online happy hour after, after, the, after, after this talk. Um, after this talk. Um, let me see if there's any last minute questions by anyone. I don't see any more questions. Seriously, thanks so much, Tim, again, for doing this talk at our meetup. Thank you, everyone who no attended. Problem. And um, 
have a great weekend, everyone. I guess. I guess. Uh, let, let me give you your evening back, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thanks for having me. It's been really great to come. It was lovely to meet you, and hopefully, like I said, one, one day we get to meet you in person when things are a bit back to normal and everyone's traveling again. Yes, one great. day, hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. In the future. Great, great, great. Thanks so much, Tim. Again, T have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. See ya. Bye, everyone.